This is part two, and the conclusion to the horror behind a webcam episode of Seriously Strange. If you haven't seen part one, watch that first. It's linked in the description below. While someone within the shadows of anonymity lurked, more and more people were lined up as targets. And while a vast majority of people would never allow themselves to be urged into something as severe as taking their own life, some were. And this unknown user would be looking for them. Before we move on to the episode, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a product designed to help men who are concerned about losing hair or concerned about the hair they're already losing. You used to have to go to a doctor and get a prescription, then go to the pharmacy and wait in line just to have like the hottest pharmacist you've ever seen walk up to help you. Now you get to tell her what you're there to pick up and you whisper it to her, a bit embarrassed. She repeats it so loudly that it rivals a train whistle. People out outside hurt her. Your face turns beet red, she goes to get it, and pokes her gorgeous head out from an aisle and says, that's for like hair loss, right? Now you're really embarrassed. Some 14 year old jackass is snickering somewhere behind you, so you run out sobbing uncontrollably and piss your pants for some reason totally unrelated to this scenario, and bam, you go bald anyway. Well, I'm here to tell you that with keeps on your side, you could win the fight against baldness. Pissing yourself, however, is a totally different thing, so don't expect any help there from me. Thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get medication delivered directly to your door every three months. Keeps helps you keep the hair you already have, while also helping you treat for the hair you've already lost. Two out of three dudes are going to experience some kind of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. So what's the best way to prevent this? To keep it from happening while you still have hair left. And Keeps has the scientifically proven treatments that could save your scalp. Take this guy, for instance. This is Matt Santoro, fellow YouTuber and good friend. But he's quite hideous to look at. It's really sad. Aside from the fact he looks horrifically deformed, he's also bald as a two-week-old fetus. You don't want to look like this freak, do you? I didn't think so. It's too late when it gets this advanced, so don't let it get to this point. And you don't have to go broke to avoid going bald. They may keep you hairy, but Keeps prices are as smooth as butter. You may say to yourself, Rob, why are you shouting out Keeps? You have such luscious locks. Your head hasn't started to go bald in the least. Your hair is just as thick and gorgeous as ever. You're a god amongst men and you're great at everything and you can have any woman or man or other you desire. So why? Because I believe in having hair. I stand by it. If I was running for the 2020 presidential election, it would be about hair and a person's right to keep their hair. And there would be American flags and fireworks and bald eagles and shit. Well, with wigs on, because bald eagles is literally the opposite of what I'm trying to say here. So go to keeps.com slash Rob Gavigan, linked in the description below, and take action to prevent hair loss. Keeps can take up to four to six months or more to see results, because beauty takes time, people. So the faster you act, the more hair can remain in your skull, you sexy bastard. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Rob Gavigan, linked in the description below. And stay hairy, my friends. Thanks for listening, and now, on to the episode. In 2008, a young university student named Nadja Kajuji embarked on a new adventure. She had been accepted to Carleton University in Ottawa, along with many other top-tier universities. She'd worked hard to get where she was, and with that came a sense of positivity that is hard to crush. After all, she had been one of out of only 100 people accepted into Carleton's public affairs and policy management program. She was truly living what seemed to be the dream, until she quickly fell in love and got pregnant. The news of a pregnancy was not well met. In fact, Nadja had taken the day after pill in order to avoid that exact result, but it was too late. As if she needed any extra stress, the man she had been in love with swiftly left her, and now she was to deal with her situation alone. What was she going to do in terms of schooling now? She knew she wasn't ready for a child. 
She knew this would affect the rest of her life, and that was what was most haunting. Whatever choice she made would be permanent and something she had to live with. These thoughts plagued Nadja's mind and pushed her into a deep depression as she felt as though she had problems with no solutions. The stress amounted to such an extreme that Nadja had a miscarriage. This tragic reality only worsened the depression she already felt as all choice had been taken from her. Nadja began to isolate herself from her peers, and as a star student this was far from the norm for her. She struggled to attend her classes and naturally worried that she would not pass the semester. In an effort to work on herself and her issues, Nadja began seeing the university psychiatrist. However, on March 1st, 2008, Nadja Kajuji posted on one of the websites asking for a suicide method that would make her death ideally look like an accident. Nadja promptly received a response from a user named Kami. Kami claimed to be suicidal as well, and as she had knowledge as a nurse, thought hanging would still be the best method. Kami and Nadja had a rather extensive back and forth, as Nadja was insistent on jumping off a bridge into a mostly frozen river. Nadja was concerned of failing an attempt and then remaining mangled or causing her family more trouble. This was an opportunity Cammie made sure to jump on to reiterate the pros of hanging. Cammie truly relied on Nadja's feelings as she said things such as, I wish we both could die now while we are quietly in our homes tonight, with a smiley face. Cammie consistently underlined the fact that this was a team effort and that they were fully in it together, further encouraging Nadja to act. In fact, in their correspondence, Nadja stated, we are together in this, to which Kami replied, yes, I promise. However, Kami was very concerned that Nadja's method of jumping off the bridge would not work, and she insisted on a backup plan, just in case. As always, hanging was the method of choice, the only infallible way to escape misery. Cammie told Nadja, if you go to a Home Depot or Menards or any kind of home improvement store, get yellow nylon rope about 8 feet or about 3.5 meters and about one half inch thick or about 3 centimeters. That is all you need and look around your apartment for somewhere to hang from. I can help you with the cam when you need to. On March 9th, Nadja decided it was time to go with her plan of jumping off the bridge. Before leaving to kill herself, she emailed a roommate and told her she was going ice skating. Her body was found six weeks later, wearing the skates still. It is unclear whether the cause of death was drowning or hypothermia. Once more, there seemed to be no repercussions for Cami. On the sites, Lee Dow maintained a rather silent and somewhat invisible presence. As with Mark, Lee Dow did not comment much publicly, but rather told posters to check their email. This made her far harder to trace, and members like Blay couldn't truly gauge the intentions of Lee Dow, who consistently kept mentioning she was a 20-something nurse from Minnesota. The posts Lee Dow commented under were always the ones in the most rush end of their lives. She specially aimed to find the most desperate and naive. For reasons unknown, in 2006, Lee Dow disappeared from the site. All those who corresponded with her came to the same morbid conclusion. She must have finally killed herself. Needless to say, many had formed a bond with Lee Dow, seeing her as a friend or at least someone who cared for them in a genuine way. However, Lee Dow did not stay away for long. Those who had been speaking with her had begun to speak to each other and her stories did not line up. In private messages, Lee Dow was still trying to convince some to kill themselves and when others wanted to speak with her on the phone, there was always a reason why she couldn't. Something was not adding up and her own supposed friends were beginning to get answers. 
This is when the users who interacted with her began to think she was getting high off the suicides of others, or that it at least provided somewhat of a thrill to be the cyber angel of death. The main recurring factor that outed Li Dao was that she continued to make suicide packs, but somehow it was the other parties who suddenly became inactive or disappeared. She constantly reemerged. Celia Blay continued to monitor the situation and tried to make as many people as possible aware of Li Dao and her strategies, but it was impossible to know how many emails or private messages were being sent and to whom. In fact, Celia Blay truly tried her very best to stop Li Dao from getting vulnerable people to kill themselves. She took all the evidence she'd gathered to the police and showed them the conversations that were ending lives. Unfortunately, the police did not take the matter as seriously as they should have. Nonetheless, Blay continued to monitor the ASH and alt.suicide methods. In fact, in 2007, Blay found herself a partner in tracing Lee Dow, a 35-year-old woman named Kat Lowe from Wolverhampton, England. Lowe was personally invested in outing Lee Dow as a friend of hers had almost committed suicide after entering into the now formulaic suicide pact with Lee. Lowe decided to go undercover in order to extract as much information as possible in terms of who Li Dao really was and why they consistently encouraged suicide as well as instructed it. Lowe posted emitting the vibe of someone who had had enough or was close enough to the ledge that a slight nudge might suffice. In 2008, Lowe sent an email to a user named Falcon Girl. She asked for a good place to swing. Using the Falcon Girl account, someone named Cammy D told Lowe about the best method to effectively hang oneself. Cammy added, I think you said you have a webcam. That would help a lot too. In none of their exchange did Cammy try to persuade Lowe to rethink her suicidal thoughts. In fact, it seemed as if she always were prepared to tell people how exactly to kill themselves. Cammy consistently checked on Lowe to see if she was ready, however, her persistence gave her away. Cammy signed off the same way Lee Dow did by saying, Hugs. At this point, Blay believed that this Lee Dao character had convinced over 50 people to kill themselves. Lo and Blay continued to monitor the situation, documenting everything they could find. Lo continued to interact with Cammy, and in what would turn out to be one of the biggest leads in the case, Cammy told Lo she knew of four people who hanged themselves. Upon further questioning, Lo asked if Cammy had seen anyone do it, and Cammy replied, No, just one. He asked me to watch as he was all alone. I didn't want to think it was some perverted ploy of his, but after many hours of talking, I agreed and watched him die so he would not die alone. Lo asked how old the man was. He was 32, just like Mark Drybrow. This was a massive development as now Cammy and Lee Dow were directly connected. Lo and Blay continued to work in order to get Cammy's trust. Lo said she was ready to hang herself, but she needed help with what type of rope was needed. She insisted that Cammy get a webcam so they could see and hear each other. That's when Lo found out that Lee Dow, Cammy, and Falcon Girl were all the same person and namely a man who definitely was not in his 20s. Lowe asked why he had pretended to be a woman, and he responded, mostly because if and only if there were any legal consequences for my helping anyone, they would come looking for a girl. Blay then took his information to another ASH user, Griffin, who had worked in telecommunications. Within days, Griffin connected Falcon Girls and Lee Dow's emails to a server in Faribault, Minnesota. In their continued correspondence, Cammy made a mistake that would cost them. The header of their email contained a name, Bill Melkert Dinkle. 
Through a wild moment of luck, Blay, while talking with a customer, found out they lived near Faribault and was friends with the deputy sheriff in Minneapolis. Unfortunately, Faribault ended up being outside of his jurisdiction and instead suggested to contact the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Blay did so and managed to get in touch with Sergeant William Hyder, part of the St. Paul Police Task Force. Suddenly, things were moving quickly, as just the next day, the Ottawa police called the Faribault police asking about Melkert Dinkle. They had called in reference to the disappearance of Nadia, whom they at the time did not know was dead. Their concern with Melkert Dinkle was that they believed someone who lived at his residence had committed a suicide pact with Nadia and might act on it. Ironically, at the time this occurred, Melkert Dinkel was on a family vacation. However, now Melkert Dinkel was on the map, and a family vacation would not shield him from the incoming investigation. Who even was Melkert Dinkel? Why did he have so much time on his hands, especially time dedicated to convincing young people to kill themselves? Ironically, he was a resident nurse, who was also married to a nurse, and they had two daughters. Melkert Dinkel's bizarre practices had begun long before he had created his online personas. In fact, he had gotten in trouble with the nursing board of Minnesota a few times. Once in 1994, where he simply did not inform the medical authorities that a resident's condition was severely worsening, resulting in the patient's death. He was constantly moved to different units as he never performed well at his current post. He was later diagnosed with a learning disability and attention deficit disorder. However, he was put on medication. Though he showed no true ability in his nursing career, he continued in the field, where he went from job to job as he inevitably made errors, some that might explain his behaviors online. In fact, in one nursing home he had worked at, he was fired for allegedly abusing two residents. This caused his license to be limited, though it deserved suspension. This negative employment history did not bode well, but it wasn't until Nadja's body was found, six weeks after her disappearance, when the river warmed and her body washed up, that he truly felt the consequences of his actions. There seemed to be a surreal disconnect in Melkert Dinkel's head. He immediately told the police the truth, mostly. When the police interviewed him, he was surprisingly direct. Sergeant Hyder asked Melkert Dinkel about his online interactions, and he immediately removed his wife from the equation and also admitted he'd used the pseudonyms Lee Dow, Falcon Girl, and Cammy. He was clear when he said he advised people online about suicide methods. However, interestingly, he never admitted to watching any suicide via webcam. Not even Mark Drybrows. The police, however, did find that he had made multiple suicide packs, around a dozen, though he could only confirm of five that effectively did end up taking their lives. In an interesting juxtaposition, Melkert Dinkel admitted that he enjoyed the thrill of the chase, but he also claimed to tell his victims that they'd be better off in heaven. Nonetheless, these two contrasting sentiments cannot exist simultaneously when one is an admission of a semi-fetish for death. The pseudo-benevolent nature of claiming his victims would be better in heaven seems like an easy line to say, but a hard one to back up. While morally this case is as open and shut as it can be, what does the law say? Is this a question of free speech and personal accountability? Can Nadja's death be truly connected to Melker Dinkel, as she did not end up using his hanging strategy at the end after all? These questions plagued the families of Mark and Nadja, as for them and most others, Melker Dinkel was the drop that made the glass overflow. Had there been a blay or a low at the time, perhaps the discussions would have led to healthy solutions. Legally, the battles were messy, 
as might be expected in cases that involve not only free speech, but intention, as well as the internet. In 2011, Melkert Dinkel was charged with advising, encouraging, or assisting Kajuji and Drybrow in killing themselves using internet correspondence. As the case was underway, he was ordered to stay offline. Additionally, Minnesota provides penalties for those who encourage or assist in suicide. The punishment can be up to over a decade in prison on top of a $30,000 fine. Melkert Dinkel received a meager 360 days in jail, just under one year. However, in 2012, the Court of Appeals affirmed the conviction, which led to the Supreme Court's review of the case. In 2014, the Supreme Court reversed the conviction and remanded. Apparently, Melkert Dinkel's conviction was not entirely constitutional, as advising and encouraging suicide was protected by the First Amendment. However, speech that assisted suicide was not protected. In the end, Rice County District Judge Thomas Newville sentenced William Melkert Dinkel to three years in prison, but suspended the sentence to 360 days in jail, along with the abiding by the terms of his probation for 10 years. Melkert Dinkel was convicted of assisting the suicide of Mark Drybrow and attempting to assist the suicide of Nadja Kajuji. Melkert Dinkel has said, quote, I am sorry for my actions and what I have done. I have repented. Even though he has been released from jail for five years now, his lawyer continues to appeal the conviction. This entire case is an accurate reflector of how everything on the internet is permanent, yet in some ways fleeting. If Mark had not crossed paths with Lee Dow at that very moment, or if Nadja hadn't corresponded with Cami at that very time. This case only exemplifies that while everything that happens on the internet is permanent in some ways, in others the timing is pivotal. The pure coincidence of being on a website at the same time as a stranger in and of itself can feel surreal, let alone when the stranger is prepared to do the unthinkable. The most haunting part of this case is that Melkert Dinkel, with his knowledge, along with his wife's, could have been actively saving lives. He could have been one of the families thanked when their children survived the darkest days of their lives. Yet he chose to be worse, a grim reaper who cannot even face his own actions. Thank you for watching. Your support means a lot to me. Comment below with what you think government should do regarding this kind of event. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on all notifications by ringing the bell now, because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.